Welcome back for game four, where KT Rolster just nabbed themselves the most ridiculous victory versus IG. For those that missed it, a base race with two auto attacks separating winner from loser. And now we stand at the precipice of game four. But now we reset for a game number four. And I feel like we need to reset as casters. You know, everyone needs that drink of water, go to the bathroom, all those things. I think the fans at home, I think we definitely need a PSA of uh, be seated for this next game. Yeah. <laughs> definitely not one for the faint of heart. It's definitely no. one that could go either way. Duke will be substituting in for the Shy. That is a big move here. Of course, Duke brings so much experience. He is a former world champion with SK Telecom T1. This does change the game style a bit, even though he can play the carries. And at the start of his career, was famous for playing the carries. Ironically, a KT Rolster, an old boy of his own as Leopard back in the day. Usually, they play more about the 5v5 and less about the field. And to your point that you brought up at the beginning, uh, Papa Smithy, this substitution very well could be trying to get someone on stage with a bit of a cooler head, a bit of a mindset that was not in that insane split push and still running at 120 beats a second. Well, we were losing our minds watching this game. I can only imagine what it was like for him watching on as his team was so close. We'd already set up all the narratives about a 3-0. It's now a 2-1. And let's see how the full reset affects picks and bats. Bands come through. A lot of focus on the support role this time around as it's going to be a colleague. Rise, that Rakan that we've seen so much of. Alistar, Thresh, and Nocturne all banned away. That means Aatrox and Urgot are both left open in this game. Was a blue side Urgot ban in game number three, and a blue side Urgot first pick in game number four. This time, of course, laning against Duke. Yeah, I mean, I do prefer the Urgot side of the matchup. Uh, we'll see what the response from Invictus Gaming has been, especially like this Rakan switch up here from KT Rolster, trying to split up the possible, uh, you know, Zaya plus uh, Rakan combination, given that Invictus Gaming have banned out the Alistar. So what will be the secondary pick on red side? Because now Rakan and Alistar are both taken away, and look at this. The is actually going to be prized away from KT Rolster. It took till game number four for Def to not be on this champion. And remember what I said, heading into game number one, this is the most played champion for Jackie in the group phase. Invictus Gaming had to play a grand total of seven games instead of six because of a tiebreaker, and in six of those, Jackie played Kaisa. If KT Rolster are looking for that full reverse sweep, then Jackie Love is probably the number one player on their list. And Kaisa now gonna be in his hands. Yes, it is a bit more comfortable, but it is also a champion uh, that does not have the same sort of forgiving ultimate as Zaya. And he's gonna have to think very clearly about he, how he uses the killer instinct to try and dodge those critical spells instead of relying on becoming untargetable. And I wanna infer a bit about how KT Rolster approached the second round on blue side because they had Tom Kench hovered for a long time, then gave it up and took Gragas into Tom. You'll notice they didn't take an AD carry and first round AD carries have been the norm. The reason for that is Kaisa because of her weaker laning phase. There's so many different picks you can lane into this pick that do different things. We've seen Sivir so frequently from Fnatic, for example, and the ability to have that utility ultimate and push. You can take a hyper carry like the Twitch or the Jinx, which of course is an old pick for Deft among the ages, or you could just go the more standard Zaya. Zaya is the conspicuous tierless champion that wasn't taken, but to Invictus Gaming's credit, they're not banning any AD carries in the second round. Yeah, pretty huge change in direction with the supports as well. Uh, with the continued support bans now. Defensive look here coming in, possible disengages from the Tom Kench as well as Braum. Interesting ban in the second phase from KT, that Zack that we brought up that Invictus Gaming's jungler likes to play sometimes along with the likes of the Camille and the Zin is banned away. KT do not want to have to deal again to go up against that, deal with that as they head into game four here. LeBlanc, Swain, Azir, also all banned. You see Gragas, Tom Kench, and you know KT also want to play a front-to-back team fight. That's the approach you usually see with picks like that. Zack is one of the ways to truly attack that with his backline access. Heavily suggests to me a big hyper carry coming through from Deft in this game, but it's not going to be unnoticed by Invictus Gaming where champions like Xin Zhao that was super high priority are still left open. And it's going to be a last pick jungle as the Syndra does come out for the side of Rookie. Syndra has been banned quite frequently so far in this series. You can see 
Pick rate, 26. Ban rate, 24. Win rate, just sub 50 overall here at Worlds. But we'll see what Rookie can do with it this time around. And I actually like this early Syndra pick, grabbing it on the first uh, pick of the second round for Rookie, because KT Rolster pretty much exclusively used UCAL on more defensive, more healthy champions for the mid lane, not lane bullies. Uh, UCAL has really excelled in setting up his team and not losing super hard or, um, you know, fighting his own fight rather than picking something as Oh, never mind. <laughs> They're really we, considering we their options. We may have the all-in assassin. Uh, the Aurelia will finally be locked in here. Could have attacked the lane, could have looked elsewhere. Rookie Syndra has been his go-to pick. Ooh. And with the final information of the Tristana, they had all options. We saw Ning play Kane in the LPL final. And if it was a hyper carry like Jinx or with no escape, maybe that's where he would have gone again. Camille's a lot more standard, but it does cement some engage for the side of IG. Ning had a very interesting game on the cane. I remember watching that one. There you was put a lot of emphasis on the start of that word for some Yeah, uh, there's a level two turret dive that sticks oh. out in my mind, but we won't see that this time around. No cane play. Instead, we'll be back on that Camille that he's known for. And you mentioned the hyper carry. You wanted to see that from the side of KT, considering the way the first half of their draft looked. And Tristana is one of those champions that can carry everything as the game goes on, as it looks like KT are swapping the Irelia in the top for Smeb again, while it's going to be Yukal on the Urgot. Yeah, I was it, such. I had such a hang up on is Yukao really going to take the Aurelia matchup into, uh, you know, Syndra looking for those kills, you know, having to call the jungler and things like that is not the case. With two seconds left, they make the swap. It will be Smeb once again in the top side, taking Aurelia into Aatrox, who can use the dash and the mobility uh, to try and avoid sweet spots on the Qs. But Urgot mid is such a different beast to Urgot top, where he largely negates and goes even at worst. In mid lane, he's going to be heavily outranged by Yukal, who go through a corrupting potion very quickly. This is not necessarily going to slow down Rookie, who is such a beast on the Syndra. That cannot be overstated. Exactly. This is much more what I was expecting from the matchup. We'll see if it actually comes to Brunt, though, because once again, Ning on the Camille is going to have a lot of early options. And since Score doesn't have access to the Zinzal this time, it is the Gragas. Things will be very different. Score had some big plays in the Gragas last time around, and we know that Ning has been instrumental in the two wins that his team has found so far. IG have found two really good early games back to back. Let's see how KT respond here, keeping themselves alive. It's still match point. Drop one more game and IG's moving on. You're going home. You can hear the crowd getting excited for game four. Both sides here shouting at Bexco in Busan. They know they witnessed one of the greatest games in world's history when it comes to a best of one for game number three. This one goes all five. Can you imagine how their voices will erupt? Whether our voices will keep up with what has been an amazing series. Incredible. If the turning point of the series ends up being that oh. game, the two <laughs> hits on a Nexus. Nightmare's fuel right there. Oh, right. that one's going to stick in your memory for a very long time if you get reverse swept after that. But IG don't want to think about that right now. Instead, they'd rather think about, boy, this will be a fun four-game series. <laughs> we'll see if they can make that goal a reality as the ever so lovely sepia tone of the pause creeps into Summoner's Rift. A little bit of calming time for the meditation you are calling for, Papa Smithy, to reset for this game. And that is honestly such a big deal. We talk so much about the mental aspect of League of Legends at this level, and they are on the biggest stage here. Worlds with all eyes on them and they've just performed one of the closest games that we have ever seen. Just to stay in a best of five, not to win, not to go even, just to stay alive, which is the insane thing to take away from this. I'm mostly looking using this time to look at the comps here and about just how strong the mid jungle duo can be at punishing the Urgot, but we're focusing on the level one setups as Jackie Love puts down his trinket ward. And for those who are fans of KT, remember the last time that they played a best of five, we saw them in that LCK summer final against Griffin, where they also started off one and two and managed to win the last two games. We'll see if they can repeat that performance here. Here's what I'll say about KT. In 2017, comebacks just weren't a thing for them. They did not have 
any speed apart from full acceleration, go for a carry in every lane and see how it goes. In the second round robin of summer, they, they really delivered on the kind of grit side of the equation. They came back in many games where it just seemed like everything was working against them. But I'll hold the historical point because Ning is working out what he can do up top. Ning going for that cheesy level two gank. Red in the <laughs> lane, but nope. No. Uh, honestly, that's probably the most common uh, ganks that we have seen uh, emerge, right? Starting red buff. But historically known as cheese. Fair enough, my Morgan friend. Dola. I am a connoisseur of the cheese then, uh, because honestly, this is what we expect from Camille's. Early red buff into Scuttle Crabs, and he's trying to control both brazenly walking across the mid lane with the mid lane push of the Syndra. This should allow him to keep the timer as well as the uh, stun does go off on Deft in the trade here. And it looks like we have a bit different of a story this time around. Amusingly, the ideal lane position for the Urgot is probably with minions pushing into his turret this early in the game because it's such a sitting duck mm. until level three because he needs to get at least his short dash, which I guess is a little bit longer in the mid lane, but relatively short. And just in general, this is a very comfortable lane for the Syndra. So because of the threat of both an Ignite Syndra and Ning on this Camille, Yukal really cannot afford to go much past these two flames you can see right at the start of this mid lane. We're already seeing the development here. Rookie starting to eke out his CS lead in the mid lane, pressuring back the Urgot, allowing for a little bit forward placement of the jungler. Exactly what Camille wants to do. Both scuttles is an amazing start uh, for this team. Well situated to next put their first ward line up and a little bit deeper into KT territory. And honestly, we've hyped up Rookie so much throughout this series, and for good reason. You can see his stats on your screen right now, averaging three kills and assists at 15, up 24 CS, which is on par with his CS difference at 15 throughout the group stage. He is the highest ranked individual player in that stat of any player in groups. And fun fact, Duke, who's been subbed in for the top lane for IG this game, has the second highest at 19. <laughs> Definitely impressive stats for the side of UCAL. I should definitely mention that with KT Rolster, we have seen so much of him playing to enable the rest of his teammates. If you remember back to the original uh, game we had in this series, his Galio teleport bottom very early gave up an entire wave of minions as well as both of his summoners to help the bottom lane get ahead, even though they didn't win. That is the, the type of thing that we have come to expect from him. Meanwhile, this time around, it's actually score going mid lane. Seeing if he can find something. Predator, body slam barrel, but nice scatter of the week from Rookie to make sure Yukal can't follow it up. A full disengage onto Yukal means that there's no kill pressure from just the Gratis. That's why he made the choice there to go for the pretty proactive use of the scatter of the week. After Marta going to push, and they need push in one lane because you don't want to have three lanes pushing and the Camille feasting on the side lanes. They've got the push and bot to the side of KT Rolster. I've been thinking a little bit about where this game goes, and I think front to back, KT have a pretty strong comp in the late game. Urga ult onto the closest member, and then focus fire from Tristana is the way you want to approach these fights. For IG, though, they have so much pick that it's around level six where Basically, everyone on KT has to cower in fear because an immediate goal injection, then just a return to the game state of game one and two is what IG is going to be looking for. And with the changes over the years to the game, uh, we always you know, talk about controlling vision and the setup when you see compositions like this, right? Um, but with the changes we've had, it's become a little bit more and more difficult to completely blanket the map and vision. And so you have to make much more meaningful choices as far as you only get the five control wards and the couple of uh, yellow trinkets that you do still hold on to. So that becomes extremely important in the timings of when you're setting up for these objectives and when you're going for the invades. Who uh, is the one with the strong lane that we can actually play off of? And then evaluating the percentage chances here for each all-in that you decide to take. Bottom side, Depth and Model farm themselves up on top side. IG thinks about maybe making a dive, but a TP comes in from UCAL, and there it is. You guys talk about him being a team player. Make sure nothing bad happens to his top laner. And he's actually forced to complete that teleport because score was so far away. Uh, and the possibility of Ning waiting there uh, was still very real. So that's why Yuka had to walk all the way down. And now it's Rookie who's moved up for a possible dive onto a low health Smep. Smep, no mana, half HP. Throws out the single blade, doesn't need the second one. Rookie goes back home. 
Definitely a shark encircling Smep for the upteenth game in a row. It was the standard uh -oh. That's why the ping is looking for the kill. Scatter the weak, finds his way on a score. Who goes for the flash and the body slam? Harpoon not gonna find his part. Rookie returning the damage down on the score. That's gonna be O plus Ignite. Not getting himself the kill though, and both will walk away. Yeah, dangerous path, uh, dangerous path there back to the mid lane. Score on the receiving end of the first Syndra ultimate. Uh, that was more to ward him off so the all-in did not come through. But we still haven't given up a first blood here. Uh, seven minutes into the game, playing a lot more respectfully. The score's bro status is definitely confirmed by the fact that he traded flashes with the Syndra. Flash and ignite down means that Yukal has been averaging what? Giving up one or two CS per wave in respect. Has had to go Spectre's Cow first. Might actually be able to push up. And speaking of pushing up, that might be the downfall of Smith. Smeb walks down toward the river here. And as he goes back into the lane, he realizes this is not a place he wants to be in. Flash for flash. Next deck ultimatum holds him down. KT's top laner's in some trouble. He tries to outplay the all the kill. And Smeb gets first blood in a one versus two. He's about to make it two. Duke will go into resurrection, but that is the play for Smeb. That's the fire that fans will remember from Smeb at Worlds Pass. He fights his way out. Ning got too close to the edge of the Vanguard's edge, got disarmed, and was not able to strike back. He held it for so long, but the ult was so critical on the disarm. Unbelievable outplay by Smeb. And after losing that previous game and having that moment, how will IG pick up the pieces? Thought it was such a good flash there from Ning at the beginning to ensure the stun as well. We'll get another look at it in our Acer Predator replay, but he goes for it, flashes to make sure he connects, then into the ultimate. But look at the stun here to then set up the Vanguard's edge and at the point disarmed both members of Invictus Gaming to live with the potion taking the entire time, trades back on the auto attacks, not hit by the Q either and he walks away feeling emboldened and empowered. Always pop your potions, the triumph proc for that 120 health, so critical as well. What a big moment for KT, because Duke's pressure lead around the top was one of the big things that IG were working with. Invictus Gaming swapped out the Shy after a dominating split push game, put in Duke, and Meb immediately is able to establish dominance there in a 1v2 outplay. That is a real selection headache if we do go to a game five of whether you swap out Duke instantly and return to the man who was dominating in the top lane. We'll see if Duke can provide some of the map movement things that he's recognized for, but that singular moment could be so important for KT. We said that a lot this series. <laughs> Theorizing maybe they were thinking cooler heads will prevail. Sometimes you want to keep the hot hand in the hot head. Here we go, though. Rookie is roaming down to the bottom side over a control ward. Hanging out on top of that control ward to make sure he's not seen. <laughs> when you're going after a Tom Kench lane, you pretty much always have your work cut out for you because Kench is so annoying saving the teammates, but Death's not really too worried about this one. Control ward thrown down into the brush. And everybody's back to farm. Back to pushing up here in the bot lane, which has been their game plan so far. Smeb, emboldened by his last outplay, will push up himself. And the map in a much healthier state for KT. You'll notice, actually, the only river vision is to control towards top side from KT. Very good point, because we've seen so much roaming from Rookie. This entire series from him, and especially this oh. game on Syndra. Woo, Jackie Love does take uh, that explosive charge, and that's going to force them off the turret. This could be very big things as KT Rolster back to their old ways of pressuring early turrets. This is how they found so much dominance previously. It seems so perplexing that previous Tristanas have gone plate footwork rather than the press the attack that opens up. Some really nice trades like that. Speaking of opening up, this will be first turret blood, the first brick going to the side of KT. And this time, they're leading the early game. They're going for two objectives. But speaking of leads, while Yukal collapsed on by three different members. Ning tries to hold on to the wall. Flash away from Yukal, wants to stay alive. Mata and Death coming in with a top catch of Missile Boy. Yukal gonna be taken very low, saved by Mata with a wonderful devour. As Balon now trying to keep his teammates alive as Ning barely gets himself out over the wall, but the charge will take him down and Death makes it two for zero. Feels like KT Rolster 
took new life for themselves out of the last game because they have come out firing here in game number four with a substantial early lead. Sort of play that would work against any support other than Tom Kens, but the official voyage was perfectly used by Mata. It allowed score, but did not finish the Drake in that play. A bit of extra time to compose himself, and they do trade up. Yukal does go down in the end, but he buys so much time. Tanky champion for Yukal in Fortune. Has the stopwatch, very important. Buying the extra time, holding on to the flash, then at the very edge of the tower range, forces all three members to hard commit if they want to finish the kill. And that allows the rest of KT Rollstar to come in and clean up two for themselves. KT are looking like they found themselves a second win here after winning that last game. And honestly, after a game like that, you guys mentioned it at the end of game three, but being able to clear your head, mental reset, come into game four without that looming over you is very important for both of these teams. And it seems like KT are off on the right foot here. A couple thousand gold up over their opponents. As we'll see them go after the cloud break. But we've seen KT have a 12 minutes like this before in game number one, and then make critical decision-making errors. Again, the clearest one is Score taking down the Rift Herald solo while his team engages in the mid lane. This is a pretty similar game state to where we were at this particular time in game number one. Let's see if KT can have those cooler heads, because if they do, this does start to feel like the KT games, where they rotate around the map, put down Smart Vision, and get a big gold lead largely through getting down those macro objectives like the turrets. Deft and Mata hanging out in the mid lane. Clearing out the minions, as you can see, multiple IG members will be around here as well. But again, it's just so hard to engage onto the Tom Kench Tristan a duo on top side, the Irelia versus the Aatrox. After Smev's outplay underneath the turret, he set himself up pretty well in this top lane. 2 0 and 1, building for the Trinity Force. Finds even more damage down to Duke, forces out the flash in the 1v1. Yeah, Smev really exerting pressure now, and it's up to the rest of the team to follow. Mata on the Tom Kench, already threatening and cutting off the support from Invictus Gaming. This will be another turret to KT Roster as they run Duke back. Score pops the Predator, tries to go in for the body slam into the barrel. Instead, just keeps Duke away and provides cover for the objective to be taken. KT are up over three. Thousand gold. And it took four games where we've seen the sort of suffocation that the analyst desk was alluding to in the pregame. But again, we want to see how KT continue to push this forward. It's a reminder of the group stage, it's a reminder of KT's potential. But IG still do have very healthy farm, specifically on the Syndra, and competitive in the other lanes. This game is far from done. And if you ask me about IG's scaling, the mid game is where they really reach the apex of their potential, specifically when Kaisa gets towards the second island. Well, she's still got to worry about her first right now, still holding on to the pieces of that Storm Razor, which has already been completed on the side of death, working on the Zeal Evolution next, as Smeb heads back into the top side to farm things up. And Smeb, he was the one who fell behind last game. He was the one who was constantly on the back foot trying to defend against that Fiora. And of all the players on the team of KT Rolster, he was the only one heading into the knockout stage that wasn't a top 10 KDA player from the stats in group. But so far in this game, he's making the individual plays to stand out. And he is a critical part of this composition for KT Wolf. So let's talk about why we feel like they have such a good handle right now. And a lot of it is due to them having the advantage in the split push and a Tom Kench. Tom Kench completely changes the way that you allocate your lanes in the mid game. Mata here has the possibility of clashing so quickly. Right now, though, they're all grouped up as five, and Tom Kench loses a lot of the power in a five on five straight up heads, heads up match. Well, Shelly is the target. Void Seeker finds its way onto Mata, looking to finish that Kench. Shelly does go down. I'm not sure who's going to be able to pick up the eye I think here. KT got it. IG trying to keep everybody away. Go in. Obviously, they didn't secure it. Otherwise, they would pick up the eye ball. It's a voyage being used to try to get another pressure point on the map, but it seems like KT have to actually abandon this Rift Herald. <laughs> it's being patrolled by Ning and Baolan. Yeah, they got to sit on this egg until it cracks here because the 
KT were the ones to get the gold for Rift Herald, and they're the only ones who can pick it up. Is sitting on the egg supposed to actually help out the situation? And Depends on how hard you sit on it. <laughs> Wait, <what? laughs> that's pretty hard. What kind of biology class did you guys take? <laughs> Okay, never mind. We're back into the game now as Def will continue farming up here in the mid lane. 170 farm on this Tristana so far. The scaling is kicking in for the hyper carry if he keeps farming up like this. 16 minutes into the game. Trist, of course, one of those champions that back in the olden days of not Storm Razor existing, it was the three item power spike, and she's still going to be pretty darn scary at three items, but Storm Razor helps her feel a little more whole soon. It's kind of that surreal point where when you go press the attack Storm Razor, you can dual enemy threats quite well, but that still if you're auto attacking onto someone like Bao Lan with his unbreakable up, or even Duke, you still do feel that damage fall off that Stana has always been associated with. With a rapid fire cannon can start poking away at turrets, but that uh, trough in damage is still situationally there, depending on who the threat is you're hitting. All right, again, it is up to KT Rolster with the power in their hands, pushing on the side waves. They have the Tom Kench. It's up to them to set their vision on the side of the map they want to create the play. Right now, Invictus Gaming, they're trying to control the ways that they push to them, but it is much more defensive-minded, uh, and they're going to be up to them to react to uh, the pushing here from KT. Last game, KT did it well enough to be able to come back and win a base race. How well can IG staunch this bleeding now as Yukao will be put into the top lane to keep on pushing up. Still no items completed. Has that garage sale hanging out in the inventory because unfortunately he hasn't been able to complete anything due to needing to rush the Spectre's cow early. See how soon he can get something going there, be more useful in these fights. Of course, he always does have the execute still. He's definitely happier in a side lane than a Ignite Syndro who's picking up minion waves on the turret. Definitely moving first is a big advantage the side of KT in scenarios like this. But trying to actually take down this mid lane turret is going to be a multi minute process, you'd imagine, unless they get an amazing hit. And KT are going to make you decide between answering Smeb's bottom wave he's pushing up on the Aurelia or the pressure that had mounted in this mid lane. It's so difficult to go with option number three, as we set up in the previous games, of attacking the split pusher because the Tom Kench can bring your mid lane power over to uh, that area. Right now, Deft and Mata staying in mid, though, trying to push on the turret after IG commit four members. They do get flash out of Smeb, who was kind of trying to work out what was going on around the Drake take here, has to flash away defensively. They don't lose mid lane turret, but KT have full control over top side. This is going to take a lot longer to be taken down, but IG showing a lot of respect, taking the most defensive path to top. They path defensively to top because they know they already came out on top in terms of the objectives by grabbing themselves the Cloud Drake there and not surrendering any turrets for it. Score takes a drink and steals away some chickens. Why not have some chicken along with your barrel full of frog? As he'll channel the Predator, thinking about coming in, looking to make a play maybe as they try to take down the tier one turret. Smeb off the side, getting himself away with the blast cone. IG will clear out some of the vision, continue to clear out the minion wave as well. They want to defend this as long as they can. They don't want to open up their end of the map that far by surrendering that objective. Spore and Smeb will disengage on the bottom side before IG are able to close distance and get onto them. Exactly like you said, Papa Smithy, the flash from Smeb being down means he has to be respectful of that long range engage. And punishment is definitely on the menu from Rookie. If you look at his item build here, he's not mainline for something like the Ludens, and he's gone for double magic penetration with the Oblivion Orb and the Sorcerer's Shoes. Abyssal Voyage is the real punishment tool on the side of KT. So whichever team has the bigger liberties in these map movements that have dominated the last five minutes of play or so, definitely has tools for some playmaking as well. We're seeing KT Rolster, especially since, well, Facula will take a little bit of a damage here in the turret, about to fall over. But we're seeing KT Rolster slowly and methodically try and push forward with their extra pressure to increase their lead in this game. They know that every single game is a must-win game for them. They cannot afford to throw away any leads. They cannot afford another team fight victory for Invictus Gaming like they experienced after gaining their lead in game one and losing that game. And this 1-3-1 one, one methodical play has yielded the mid lane turret that was looking tricky to take. And for the viewers at home, what we should be looking for, if you're an IG fan, you want to see 
a way to actually set up defensive vision around an area that KT needs to face check the Baron, for example, and actually have Rookie in threat range rather than picking up minions. You see Rookie and Duke in top and bot lane while KT run around the map. That's just not playing to IG's comp strength, but a good sign that KT are prepping their minion waves well. The side of KT, they're happy to keep playing three lanes until they take that, find that moment to actually collapse onto an objective or a pick. KT are also making sure they give as much farm as humanly possible to their AD carry. And in groups, 58% of their lead at 15 minutes was deft. They put so much into him. He was how they succeeded so frequently. And here in this game, sitting on a kill, sitting on two items, sitting on a CS lead of 25 over the next closest person in the game, which is his counterpart in that Kai'Sa, he's in a good spot to be powerful in the beginning. I also really like the Tristana pick as far as Buster Shot does have a lot of answers for uh, the small amount of engage that Invictus Gaming have. If a Camille uses the Hextech ultimatum, then uh, Death can answer that ultimatum with the Buster Shot pretty quickly, forcing him out of his own area and thus breaking it. Or the other thing that you'll usually see is Aatrox pop popping his own ultimate just for the speed to run at people to get picks can also uh, be used there to try and get a knockback. Very effective tool, plus the ability to buffer through CCs like we saw him do in the laning phase against the Brom stun using the rocket jump just to make sure you get out of those as well. Tristan is such a safe champion and Def, the mechanically talented player, knows exactly how to get the most out of those as he'll continue farming up here. But let's put it together. Now we get a, even more of a confirmation of why the Zac ban. Because what was available? Camille and Sin to run at you. Tristana disengages them well. Can't do that with the Zac. KT used the ultimate here to get another turret. That's number four. Four to zero for the side of KT. Number four means a 5k gold lead as KT continued to own this map. That is the effective use of the Abyssal Voyage. Tom Kench's late game wild card that we just saw there earns them an objective uh, with the very quick movement of every member over to the bottom side. Now they're positioning within the Invictus Gaming jungle for a possible play around mid. Predator Pop now should uh, signal Invictus Gaming that they were looking for something. Now this brush is the one that EDG used to punish KT Rolster in the group stage, and it seems like KT have done their VOD review on that one. They do not want to set up a vision brush that has Rookie in threat range. I see Rookie pretty close to KT members, but Smeb. Tom Kench is on you. Smeb on the flank. Smeb wants to see if he can find something onto anybody, even Balon. Vulnerable if he gets caught up here. KT doesn't want to push up any further forward, put themselves in a bad spot for a pincer attack. Scatter the Weak comes out, but will not find its way onto anyone as Ning continues to just stay cool in the pixel brush in case a fight breaks out. He wants to be able to be that threat onto a key member of KT, but he can't do it. Smeb still off to the right here as well, looking for a chance to mount a flank of his own. And because we've seen 1-3-1, one, one, Syndra picking up minion, minions at the top in a turret, and also Smeb pushing in a bot, you can be pretty confident if you're KT that there's no vision in front of the river, especially around the Drake. It's an infernal spawning in 25 seconds. And even if they don't have vision down there, they can be 99% sure that IG doesn't eat. So if you are IG, you've made it so they haven't got any more kills recently. But the bleeding continues. The objectives continue to pile up. The next objective, the infernal Drake, now on the board just two seconds from now. So you've got to wonder, What's the play? When do you eventually have the opportunity to get yourself back into this game, or is it just waiting for a KT mistake as Jackie Love oh, gets himself that... jumped on, nearly killed, oh. barely kept alive. Yukal tries to go for the flash and the execution, but a flash away from Jackie makes sure he's out of range. Well, I was going to say it's incredibly dangerous to walk through a dark jungle up to contest an Infernal Drake, but it is impossible with your Kai'Sa in base. So. Well, never mind. It is not impossible. They do just that. Put some wards onto the Drake, and Jackie Love running right back to the scene of the crime. Jackie wants to try to get back to the team as fast as he can, but the damage from Deft is so serious right now. A couple of shots onto Jackie makes him really long for the fountain there as IG. <laughs> All right, Rookie is preparing with spheres for Syndra in the brush for extra damage. Alon finding just a little bit of zoning opportunity towards KT, and IG just picked themselves up Drake. 
Well, contest. See you throwing up your hands there, Kobe. That is the biggest caster curse I've done in a, quite a while. Uh, Jackie Love nearly killed, sent back to base, yet immediately afterwards, IG get the wards on the dragon, run straight through, find some positioning, pass the mid lane, take the objective without taking any losses in answer. Now we see Jackie Love just back away here. Picking up the minion wave, suddenly some items that weren't there are completed. The Trinity Force has been pieced together for the better part of 26 minutes. It's there now for Ning, and while, yes, he's very squishy and can be turned upon, if IG can find another way to bring KT to them, there is some burst damage here to potentially find a pick and then make this game all about a 50-50 bound. Ning and the rest of IG will try to control that Baron as much as they can right now second seed from the LPL. The last time they played a best of five was also the summer final of their respective league. They're calling for a split push. We have Kings on the bottom side of the map for Smith to keep going towards the inhibitor turret. Meanwhile, KT lose mid turret. Smev's marching in the split push, which means the job of the rest of the team is to stop the backs. But it looks like they don't want to commit super hard to that right now. Smeb still hanging around, but staying out of vision range to see who comes to try to stop the push, and it will be Duke. This is all about the trades, though. You were asking earlier about how to move forward when you're being pressured. It's all about using a push to get solo vision around a big objective like the Baron. You know Aatrox is reacting. You know Aurelia has the ability to move first. They now have some defensive vision for the Aurelia and it's just about continuing to stretch Invictus Gaming further than their comp intended to be stretched. Syndra wants to be patrolling, not picking up farm, and it's in those moments where she's backing away that KT control the map. And thus far, I think IG might be pretty happy with how little they have lost during this time. Um, I believe it's just the secondary turret on bottom side, and yet they were able to get their first turret of the game in mid lane there for finally a little bit of money. Now KT want to make a play on a rookie here, possibly. Let's see about the answer, though, because Ning and Jackie Love very ready to collapse. And you can see the Tom Kench and Tristana still in the mid lane, but ready to make an Abyssal Voyager. They're rotating up now, but it's going to be Yukal in trouble first. Tries to get down the Harpoon on the Ning. We'll take him to about half HP. Ignite down there as well. Score's going to get him low, but not low enough for the Execute. Backs himself up, sees Duke into the the fray with the ulti, but Smeb makes his way in, dropping down that ultimate from the Irelia. Disarm on a Balon. The charge is on his head there as well. Def trying to put down some damage, but neither side has enough, and both walk away. The series kind of hanging in the balance of these team fights. KT Rolster do have a sizable gold advantage here. However, Invictus Gaming with a very good disengage there after prodding KT Rolster to see how quick the reaction would be. That is four ultimates down. Oof. That's why you always keep your Tom Kench near your AD carry. Death gets himself saved. Balon's gonna be taken low. Ning thinking about coming in from the side there. Scores the one who gets stunned up at the start of the fight. You can't find the follow-up and KT once again gets themselves away. That was a five-member pressure from Invictus Gaming to try and force while Smeb was showing mid lane with no teleport. But this time it is KT Rolster with a very good disengage to allow Smeb to push that minion wave all the way to the turret. A slow push in bot lane as well means the Aatrox has to answer. This is the moment to walk up, and that's why you see KT, KT in a turret. KT doing a good job fighting back 4v5 means the map opens up to them, and they get to take down the tier two. Control from KT Rolster earns them another secondary turret here. It, it, it is at a slow pace, but it is still increasing. And again, they're leaving behind wards every time they push in. And the wards that IG had on the map are either timing out or being cleared in the process by KT Rolster. So every time they get a moment's breath here, when you have a reset and base from KT Rolster, they have to go back out replace those control awards and reset up. And it really does play to the point we talked about earlier about effective DPS or damage uptime for a carry. If we were playing this from the perspective of IG, you're always second guessing. You're always getting ready to mouse back and move back for fear of being caught. So the chances of actually being able to stick and engage or even make an outnumbered play that on paper seems possible, but the probability is so wildly off because you have 
limited information makes it so tricky to actually get back into this game for IG if KT can continue to play as disciplined as they were unable to in game number one. Checking in on where everyone's at, a couple of big purchases are coming online. You have the Guardian Angel completed for Smiths. In the next fight, he's got that second life. Void Staff for Rookie means any magic resistance being built on the side of KT, like that Negaton Cloak you can see for Score, or the Hex Drinker for Death, is going to mean that much less. Also, you've got the Stopwatch on the side of Score as well, so he can go in, make the initiation, and still keep himself alive. Same thing being said for Mata. The fights have been non-existent for the past 20 minutes, almost. There haven't been any explosive kills. There have been some attempts. But now we'll see where it goes from here. KT thinking about a teleport, but they cancel it. They'll just continue pushing up this top side. That was actually huge. Abyssal Voyage plus teleport used there from KT Rolster with Dragon just spawning right now and Baron Vision easily contestable. Now it's Invictus Gaming actually with the onus to push both mid and clear out vision at the exact same time. KT rolls are being punished for all those resources being used topside. It's not going to mean an inner turret going down, but it does mean map positioning is IGs to control the fade off for the first time in a long time. So nice move there. I think Skull was trying to get over and his body slam was interrupted. I couldn't tell for sure. That's what it looked like. And they will yield a further objective in the ocean drain. For a team that's down 6,000 gold and has not been in control of the tempo for a long time, IG's doing a good job on these drakes for themselves. Three to one will be the final elemental count. KT thinks about the option for a fight here. Five men strong in the mid lane. Doesn't matter if you have the teleports, if everybody's grouped up for a big team fight. Things off to the side in the brush. Has to retreat as Smith makes his approach. It's not a 1v1 that Camille's gonna win at this point in time. Def trying to find some pot shots onto these guys, but won't get the opportunity to land too many of them just yet. And I think this is the moment where you have to look at KT and say, okay, easy objectives are down. What is their map? What is their vision to get the big objective? Which in this game is certainly the Baron. They don't have top enemy red side control. This seems like a game that requires multiple invades into the red side to truly get control and take advantage of, say, back timers from IG when their wards are cleared out or some sort of miraculous pick. But when there's a Brom on the enemy team, there's not a lot of pick. So there's going for the last easier objective in this last inner turret. There you go. KT secure it for themselves. Yukal will take a couple of bumps on the head for it, but that's all. KT trying to rotate themselves back through that red side jungle now. Set down some vision as they go. Getting away from the scatter of the week means nobody's going to be caught out any further. It looks like Yukal's going to get himself back to base. All right. We are entering... The steps of the late game, where the AD carries step up or go home. Everyone else is important, but mostly in relation to how they play around both of these marksmen. Deft, the veteran here for KT Rolster, and Jackie Love, the one who has not yet performed under these high pressure situations. Now, wielding the Kai'Sa, scaling multiple items into the late game. So much of the damage potential held in both of these two players' hands. And it will be about how can the front lines enable them and take away on some of that uptime you mentioned. And thinking about that, prophesizing what this fight looks like, we should talk about the fact that it's Urgot Aurelia as a frontline, specifically the Urgot that is very, very tanky early, multiple stopwatches. Meanwhile, it's a much more conditional frontline on the side of IG. Does Ning have his stopwatch? Is Aatrox's ult available? Are things you have to ask? And there's no counter by to say the more Malmortis that Deft has. Deft wants to frontline and trust in his, uh, his uh, tanks to be able to allow that. Meanwhile, Jackie Love has to be so much more patient waiting for the right ultimate. In addition, the extra money on KT Rolster allows them to buy items that give them more power on the front line. The Gargoyle, oh, now we got a pick! Going in on the Ning, seeing if maybe they can find him. Barrel's gonna knock him back. Next step, ultimatum is done. Balon gonna be trying to control the rest of KT. Ning getting himself away. Mata's gonna be taken down below half now as well. Smed going in on the three Whoa. people. Balon's gonna be dropped. Def has the damage as there comes your execution. Yukal's able to drag him back. Resurrection goes through. Smed's gonna be brought back on that one. Ning tries to go after Def, not able to find him. Jackie goes in as well, but he's gonna be brought down. This could be it. KT's able to find the game. They're able to find the fight. I think we're going to game five. Just like that, KT Rolls to get the game-breaking pick, and we will be going to game number five!
five. The table setting was so extensive, but the payoff was so quick. They just win the game on one play. IG needed to pull the trigger, and KT are the ones to force us to game five. An incredible job from KT. Rolster brings the score up to two all, meaning only one more game will decide who becomes the semifinalist. I think everyone is organizing their thoughts. The players you see packing up are exhausted. The casting team here is already thinking about the adaptations that were made in this game really allowed KT to hold it down. This is the KT people thought would show up in game number one, but it actually ended up being the KT that needed three games on the stage in order to be ready. The change here, switching out Duke, Smeb with a huge 1v2, it felt like so much of the win was taken out of the IG sale. Very early. And now we're, we're at a game point where if you just throw out the beginning of this entire series, this is all that matters. All yeah. that matters is the next one going forward. And I believe, I think it was Scara that I one time asked about this, about what happens when you get to a 2-2, like the mental state and everything. He's like, if one team won the first two and the other team won the next two, my money's always on the team that won the most recent two because they've got momentum. They've got that mental advantage, and IG needs to reset. But remember, RNG went 2-0 up in that LPL final. IG won the next two games, and then RNG closed the door. It can still true. happen in games like this, and even just hearing about lineups and stuff is so important here. KT have the choice of side in game number five, and it's hard to see them giving up the blue side that seemed to be their curse until that big change in game number three. Now it might be their salvation. There's a reason why people put so much weight on worlds and performing under clutch situations because this is where you really prove who the better team is. The rest of your season actually doesn't even amount for much uh, compared to how you perform at worlds. And that performance is so very important on every single individual level, like we've already said multiple times throughout this series. And for this game, the MasterCard player of the game goes to Smeb in the top lane. From the moment he made that 1v2 outplay, he was destined for greatness. And it's the sort of play that was very much a long time coming. Smeb was not great in the LCK final that went all five games. He was not great in the group stage, being solo killed by Liang on the side of Mad Team. Even in this series, he'd definitely been creaking a long compared to the shy who seems super warmed up in terms of the 1v1 but a play like that goes so far because the other lanes were doing what they were doing they weren't necessarily winning and the amount you kind of puff up your chest both as smeb and the rest of the team when a plan comes together really really helps the team's momentum part of it is also how well he recovered after the last game and yeah. so much pressure on it you know even though the entire game uh in game number three he spent on the receiving end yep. of the split push he still was able to have a clear mind in that game get the minions off teleport in for the victory and then come out strong Yep, and in the final team fight, he's right there throwing the blades into the back lines, making sure his team can find that win. And KT Rolster were pushed to the edge, and they've now pushed Invictus Gaming right there with them. It's game five. See if IG or KT take the first spot in the semifinal right after the break. Well, Smeb going in on the three Whoa. people. Balon's going to be dropped. Death has the damage as there comes your execution. Yukal's able to drag him back. Resurrection goes through. Smeb's going to be brought back on that one. Think tries to go after Death. Not able to find him. Jackie goes in as well, but he's going to be brought down. This could be it. KT's able to find the game. They're able to find the fight. I think we're going to game five.